Welcome to My World of Luring. Luring, critically important teaching tool for me, for all the dogs I've taught over the last 40 years, and probably what it does for me as a teacher. So we can look at any protocol, and if we only judge it on seeing beginners or people that are not very skilled at it, we might dismiss the protocol. But it's not the protocol that can ever be at fault, it's the application of the protocol. I rather think if I saw learner drivers, I would probably never get in a taxi. But once we've seen somebody use a protocol or look at the skills they're using, it can seem effortless. And in actual fact, we get lured into wanting to learn how to lure because this provides us with access to more information. So luring's around us all the time. It certainly is for dogs because they are aware of their surroundings. We're all looking for opportunities for reinforcement. And any time a reinforcer is presented directly to us, we're probably in a state of being lured. But in the people world, it's called marketing. And marketing is a well-respected profession. It's very well researched. It's thoroughly examined at all levels because there's a lot of money to be made out of marketing. And we are surrounded by marketing, but we do learn how to ignore it. We learn what not to respond to and what to respond to. Um, and a lot depends on our motivation at that time, whether we respond to something. So we are all being lured. You can see here, um, Time is lying down chewing a bone, and I'm sure that's no accident that he knows she is behind him. Is he luring her? Yes, to what effect? We don't know, but it certainly looks like there's a deliberate, I have this bone and you don't, information about this. And she is definitely wanting that bone, so she is being lured. Dogs are very susceptible to being lured, which is why we use it a lot. <coughs> so, why would we bother want to learn more about luring? I define luring as the direct use of the reinforcer to elicit the behaviour. Direct being the qualifying term here. I only use reinforcement. I'm not going to uh, elicit a behaviour by the threat of punishment. So this reinforcer could be anything the dog desires at that time or anything you desire. You can get lured into wanting to learn something, wanting to change your status. So what is a reinforcer for you is also an access pathway for being lured to it. The common use of reinforcement as lures was all based on the scent. So how attractive was that food? Cooking better food or having high value reinforcers would probably make the luring process easier. But this is just a limited view of what luring is. If you see luring as a motivator, then we are depending on the dog's hunger or the scent of the attractiveness of what we're offering to be our form of motivation. But I see luring as a form of information. It's a way of communicating to the dog how to succeed. So working with dogs, they spend their lifetimes trying to work out how to please us, how to make our days go better, I hope. And being able to give them the information on that is part of our responsibility. But how we give that information through luring, this is where the skills come in. So for me, luring is a tool to set up the dog for success with ease, confidence and understanding. It should never be confusing. It's a communication tool. So here is a young collie learning how to use my cup on a stick. This is a just a standard measuring cup. I put the food in the cup and she's already learned how to follow the cup. And sure enough, there's the food. And in this behavior, I'm just trying to teach her how to turn 180 degrees. I'm using the word spin as the cue. And as you watch, I will get that cup out of the picture by making it less significant. So it starts to become just a gesture as opposed to a fully prescribing the circle. There we go. So the new coup comes just before the actual cup lures her into a circle. Do we want to go again? Turn. 
So just being able to use this scent cue, we can teach a whole range of behaviours. So I'm sure you're familiar with the, the ABC that we are working with. We have the antecedent, which leads on to the behaviour, which results in reinforcement. And round we go the cycle again. Luring is part of the antecedent. So the lure will become tied to the antecedent, elicit the behaviour, and then it goes over to become part of the reinforcer. So this cycle changes round as we go round and we have a lure cue and then we deliver the reinforcer. At some point, the lure is removed from the antecedent and taken over to become part of the reinforcer. The cue should still look the same. In actual fact, you can still use the food, but something else will probably come in to do the reinforcer. What I'm looking for is how direct is this lure to the dog? And we can start with very direct. There's hot food right up your nose and the dog is going to respond to it. Or we can go right down to just a suggestion of food in the air. The suggestion or obvious. So obvious food up your nose or just a suggestion because I've just opened my treat bag. I've just chopped up some sausages and there's a suggestion of something good is going to happen. So the obvious is more direct than the suggestion. And as we go through each step of this, we become closer to one end or the other. So obvious is on the nose, suggestion, I've opened the treat bag or opened the box. And the dog will respond with an open box of treats. They will go into inquiry, what are we going to do? What do you like me to do? What can I do to earn this food? So there's no direct information as to what they're going to do. They just know that we've opened a training session. Where at the other end of the scale, when I put that food on the nose, they're probably going to start nibbling it and then we can walk or we can actually move them to a spot that we feel that we need to respond to. And there's a whole range of luring strategies between these two. So let's have a look at them. So the first one is probably lure in the hand. This is probably the most familiar one. It's not on the nose, but I keep a lure in the hand and what I want the dog to do is to follow it probably six to ten inches away or a good couple of hands length away from it if they follow this I will then give them the treat. The key to this being communication is there's two stages of this. First you follow because you follow I feed you but they can look very much the same so my follow hand has a particular shape to it and when I go to feed I change, I can either drop the food to the floor or I can open my hand for them to come and take to eat it. So there's no worry for the dog to work out when to follow and when to eat. What we don't want is them trying to get a mixed understanding of eat a bit, follow a bit, eat a bit, follow a bit. It's, it's either one or the other from what my hand is actually indicating. So the next stage then is the little video I showed you, which is we call a cup on a stick. This is one of the metal measuring cups. I like the um, square shaped bottom on these cups because you can, you can really work that cup and not lose the food accidentally. So you can almost hang the cup vertically and the food will just stay in that corner shape. If you tend to use a round bowl or a flat disc to hold the food on, it limits the amount of dimensions you can actually move the cup through. So the stick length, probably at least as long again as your arm. And again, this is follow, so the dog learns to follow where the cup's going and the food is then dumped on the floor. The dog does not take the food out of the cup. The same as with the hand, the behaviour is about following. My hand might open for the dog to eat or I could put it on the floor, but the difference is with a cup on a stick, they follow it and I actually tip the food to the floor or else I can fling it right down the room. I can choose how I deliver it. The next stage is a reward station. And this is probably a pot of food that I open. Um, it's got a lid on it, so the dogs can't help themselves to it. But what I want the dog to learn is to focus on that food station and wait for the person to come and arrive there to give them the food. Lots of applications of this. We'll look at this in detail. The next one coming close to suggestion is what we call scent invitations. And a lot of the search work we do for dogs they need to learn very specific patterns of searching. So if you were teaching a dog to search in an enclosed room, the scent may be at about uh, 
dog's nose height and downwards, they'll probably pick that up quite easily because dogs, most of their scent does come from up underneath their nose. But for a search dog, they will also need to maybe search the ceiling tiles. Well, to teach them these different search patterns, where to put your nose to find different scents, we would need to actually teach them to search maybe for food to start with so they learn how to elevate their heads and go to different places. But these are suggestions. This is just the air scenting that they're going through. So each of these steps is on this continuum from very obvious to just suggestions. Each has its own way of being clear communication. And by teaching each of these steps, the dogs understand what they're supposed to do as they're learning this. So the difference between being an interactive learner where you learn with your teacher or just being a passive learner where you are taught something to you. We learn the different processes of teaching. So looking at them in detail, let's start with on the nose. So food on the nose, um, holding the food tightly in your hands and you have the pointy fingers, you waft it under the dog's nose to engage and then they can lick and nibble the food. So this, this has a clear indicator that if you've got a dog that's a bit of a shark, you could end up having your fingers being bitten. So there's a limited use for this. So the dog will walk and lick or nibble, but they should not be biting the fingers. Um, teaching this is, is quite a skill in itself. So when would we use this? You can use this with young puppies. Certainly it encourages a very focused attention because they're virtually eating on the move. And if you've ever seen anybody eating on the move, they'll probably walk into a lamppost at the same time. But if you need to walk a dog past something that they haven't got the skill to be able to ignore, it can get them out of trouble. You might be teaching the dog to walk down the road, but crossing the road, you need to go at a certain speed and you can't afford them to stop and have a chew on the roadkill in the middle of the road. So we might use this lure to quickly take them across the street. The dog could be at your side if you're going to walk past something, or you could walk backwards, encouraging the dog to come towards you in front. So it's a temporary transport for a novice dog that doesn't have the skills to be able to walk in complex environments. But do release that food frequently. It starts to become very frustrating for the dog, um, especially if they're walking past roadkill. They've got to make a choice between a piece of food they can't get out of your fingers or getting a good mouth of squirrel. They're probably going to go for the squirrel. So if their history is walk a bit, nibble a bit, get a good chunk, walk a bit, nibble a bit, get a good chunk, they're going to stay with the walk a bit, nibble a bit. Skill-wise, I like to teach people this. They need to feel the contact of the dog's muzzle licking the food and then they can actually view the environment they're trying to take the dog through. So you're not probably looking at the dog, you will feel where the dog actually is, um, but it is easy to keep going for too long. So keep it short and frequent foods. The next one is having the lure in your hand. Now the cue for this is again, the food held in your fingers you waft it under the dog's nose to engage, but you move it away from the nose. You don't keep it on the nose as you would for the nose contact. In this situation, as soon as you give that waft under the nose, the dog should alert, move towards your hand. Because they move towards your hand, which is moving away, you'll give them food. It really doesn't come much easier than that. But you do need to be clear, very, very clear when to follow, when to eat. This hand lure guides the dogs to follow and it's three dimensional. So we can go horizontally, you can go up and down or you can go round in a circle. So following this hand lure through short actions and maintaining the gap. Maintaining the gap is critical, otherwise the dog will slip back into nibbling as they go. Change the hand when you feel the dog is responding and you open the hand like the pony hand and the dog can take it. So that works like a click. So you lure with your hand shut, open the hand when they've got it right and they get to take the food. Again, don't keep them going for too long. Frequent reinforcements. This is really good for nose first movements. But again, you can only tend to use it within arm's length of your own body. Something like teaching the dog sit down, turning around, healing. Yes, all easy to teach with lure in the hand. The skills you're going to need, tricky. You need a hand that's fast enough moving to keep away from the dog. If it's too slow, you'll end up on the nibble. 
if it's too fast, the dog will lose the connection to it. So this is where the skill comes in. And it requires you to observe the engagement level of the dog as you're moving them through different shapes. So we use this very frequently for first contact training. I think it certainly teaches a person to read the dog's body language, to read what they're learning, to see the shape of what they're learning. And it's, it's quite reinforcing for the person to be able to see how they can maneuver the dog. If the dog is far too fast coming in on the food hand, you can either start with several pieces of food just to take that utter hunger away. But if they're coming in to lunge at the hand from their experience, just a short lure, a few inches, the dog maintains the gap and then you drop the food into a bowl. So there's no danger of the hands getting bitten and the dog will start to relax as soon as they realise that following this hand, oh, it's going to pay off. Follow this hand, good Lord, it pays off. That quickly, they will stop trying to lunge for it. If they see a hand moving away from them, as some form of baiting competition to chase and bite it, then we need to change their experience of what a lure hand is. It's just information. We're not trying to tease them into doing something and then lose the food if they're not fast enough. So you will need to rehearse luring with the hand and then changing it into the you can take it. So to begin with, she knows that food's on the side. She ate that stupid and she watches the hand take the food, watches me transfer it to the other hand and then she stays with the hand. She's quite experienced. You don't have to go as fast as this to keep her attention. Ah, got her there. So this is like two people training the dog. If you've got two hands... It can become a bit of a, a mess as to who's actually talking. So here is the lure and there is the lure and it's above her head and when it comes below she can take it. Now this is a luring exercise that we teach to start with, how to lure your dog to go behind you. You see the hand change is tricky, it's tricky for us and it's complex for the dog. So she follows it round, we chuck it, she goes to get it. The clarity of how you use your hands is directly related to the success of this for the dog. So if she goes round behind me, I chuck and she gets a piece of food. This seems logical, she says. Let's do this again. See how I check that she watches me collect the food? Got the right hand. Super. Now we swap hands and she goes a little bit further before I chuck it to the floor. If you're not very good at swapping, use a piece of food in both hands. A little bit further each time. Oh. Okay, so this is young Zip, so I'm just in the middle of teaching her her heel position. It's lured and the stool in the middle of the room just helps her keep her body in the position I'm looking for while she focuses on the food. So because she's jumping to the food, I need to be really clear 
when she gets it. And she, in this condition, she'll only get it when I bring my hand down to her. So it teaches her a very accurate position in the heel position, or it's as accurate as I make my hand. And she gets lots of help in how to do the behavior. She says, I quite like this heel work. So, cup on a stick. So, our cue for this is the cup, the scent coming from the cup, and this needs to engage under the dog's nose. So, if you just placed a treat on the floor, when you load the cup, you will need to make sure that the cup comes back to the dog and they can get the scent of what's in the cup. Just because there's a cup above their head, the scent is probably not coming out of it. They'll just think, yeah, sure, so there's a measuring cup up there. But as soon as they see this cup, they'll become alert and move towards the cup. Now, because this cup is always the cue to follow, if we're not actually in the middle of training, you must put the cup out of sight because we want to keep it precious and we want to make sure that every time I see it, their heart beats faster and they engage with it. So no cup, you can take a break. Now the cup actually has a, a language. When the cup's moving, we want the dog to follow and maintain this gap. So if you move the cup slowly, the dog should walk. If we move the cup low underneath something, the dog will go under something. And if we move the cup in a circle, the dog will go round in a circle. So they will follow the cup at the same speed the cup is moving. Now, if I turn this cup or lower it to the floor, it means the food's coming. So as soon as I lower the cup, the dog will start to speed up. And if I move the cup upwards, the dog will stop or, or slow down. So having a clear language that the dog can understand acts extra dimension to the luring as a tool. So what can I teach? I can certainly build engagement over a, a distance that's further away from me. So I have my whole arm length plus the length of the cup, which, which builds up um, a focus point further away from us and I can build up quite a bit of speed and the cup starts to become a scent target if you like a scent lure so the dog will follow the scent of this cup going through the air now the benefits of this is that my hands have no association with the cup there might be some background information from the way I stand when I hold the cup but the dogs do not have to learn what my hands are doing and later on I don't have to take my hands out of the picture because the dog's further away I can actually see how they're doing the behavior and because I like to teach um, different behaviors like gating turning looking at the actual balance and momentum of the dog I can see the whole dog much easier it gives me a greater range of movement, particularly with large dogs. If you're trying to turn one of the Gordon setters close to you, your arm length is often insufficient to be able to give them a range of movement so I can get much further away. And with small dogs, you can keep that cup at ankle height and they still can't take the food out of the cup if you keep it moving. So you don't have to keep bending. If you've got dogs that are a bit likely to take your fingers off this cup on a stick allows you to use the lure behaviors you can lure the sit you can lure the follow but you can actually deliver without it being a risk to your hands it works quite well for tigers as well i should imagine so the skills you're going to need because scent normally rises the cup you need to be aware of this cup going under the nose to engage the the dog before we elevate it and you will need to learn to use your cup with both hands where the back of your hand leads or the front of your hand leads. So it's like holding a tennis racket. You can use the backhand or the forehand on the cup and with both hands. You certainly will need to practice cup loading, dumping where you need the next behavior to start and short tosses to a fool wang it across the room. Yes, this cup has a tremendous range to it and I probably would not want to be without a cup these days. So here is Zip just at the early stages of learning how to use the cup. So it's a short cup. She takes a waft. I click and look, it twists. And straight away there's food. So all she had to do was look at it. Like these cups. Her first experience of this, she obviously had some back history of sticks not being good news, but we've got rid of that. 
And this cup is a very cool thing. But the same as if you're using the lure with the hand. It needs to go at the right speed to keep the dog engaged. Not too fast that the dog loses it and not too high. So this is where she is a couple of months later. So I'm starting to put this nice smooth behaviour on cue, spin. It's a fairly long cup at the moment, I'm just shortening it. And instead of being the full circle, it just comes a small gesture. So we're starting to make the significance of the cup less and less, but she has other information taking over, which is the word spin. So the next one is our reward station. This is a pot of food in a closed box or where the box is placed where the dog can't actually help themselves. And the dog will recognize this box of food and what it is. It doesn't take them too long to work on that. When I place this, I want the dog to actually stay with this box. So if I open the box of food or I'll use a specific box and the dog will actually stay at the point where the box is. We teach them that if they look at the box instead of me, I will open the box and give them a piece of food. So I don't want a confusion here between the later protocol of putting a box of food out and walking away because we're going to be training and putting a box of food out and I want you to stay there and watch it. The two things can look very similar. So if I want the dog to focus on the box of food, I'm very clear that they're either on a grooming table or that the box of food is placed in such a spot that the dog would find it hard not to look at it. And I'll probably use a very specific box or anything that helps the dog know, stay with the box, don't follow the person because that's my point of this. So it's really useful for husbandry behaviours. So the Gordon Setter you saw me training does not like her feet hair to be trimmed whatsoever. So she stands on the grooming table. I place the box of treats where she can't reach it. If she lets me handle her feet and just get the hair ready to cut, I mark it. I reach for the food, and give her a treat. She doesn't help herself to the treats, but because she's focused on that box, she does stand still while I work on her hands, on her feet. It's also useful if you want to send the dog forward. So if you wanted the dog to go over a jump, but they're used to you being the carrier of the reinforcer, by setting up a reward station further away, it would lure the dog to move forwards away from you. So this reward station is primarily to stop you being the reward station, is to say to the dog, go towards this reward station. So if you are using the, the treat bag, the center food in the air to come find you, be careful you don't mix these two up. So this is young Zip again learning a chin rest. This is for her future grooming. It's very specific. She'll train here on this oh, stool. God. Excellent. Steady. Okay, I'm not expecting her to come away from the food at all. Good. And she's always hungry. So this is what we call breakfast in bed. So she looks at the food box. Cool. I will open it and take the food to her. So she gets breakfast where she's actually standing. Cool. Cool. So my marker here is the word cool. She's at least standing still now. She's focusing nicely on the pot. But at the moment, to get her to focus on the pot, my hand has to be connected to it. Steady, steady, steady. Steady. Good. Wow. And you could just see her there, just reach for the food. Good. 
that little push and nudge towards it. That's exactly what we're looking for. And it's luring from this pot that allows us to build this behavior. So the next one is the scent invitations. This is the scent of food in the air already says the dog, oh, there's something worth looking for. But again, you need to make sure this is given as a cue to begin to search. So every time we train, we open a pot of food, but it doesn't mean the dog should start searching for the pot of food. So we need to make sure it's on cue. So we will put these food choices, so small amounts of treats. If we want a dog to search up and down, we will make sure that there's food in different heights. In You can put it into a room, you can hide it behind places, underneath places. And the puppies, even six-week-old puppies, will wander around trying to locate the smells of these food. This is how a dog hunts, and then eat us very quickly as a reward. So they're learning the skills of fine-tuning their scenting source skills. So as they walk through the room, they'll get a, a slight smell of food, and they'll follow where that's coming from to the source of it. And there's something in a dog's brain that says, if this is where the rabbit was caught three years ago and you go past again, they're going to check again. They never seem to forget where they've been successful. So even if you were just training in your sitting room and you put 12 pieces of food around the room, up here, down here, behind here, each of these are free access for the dog to help themselves to. I would put money on it every time the dog goes into the room, they will check out those locations again. So there's some memory connection between where food is. But what it is very useful for is actually building up these patterns. But if they've searched the pattern and then they come across a closed box, certainly a closed box if it's got holes in the top that says this is full of food, we would actually get an indicating behavior. And an indicating behavior is person, come and open this box for me. And they might sit still, they might lay down, but they're probably going to look at it which means that they've found something they want you to come and, and open the box for. Further down the road, we would pair that with specific scents that we want the dog to actually look for. So by using different placement of treats, we can actually teach the dog to search in specific areas. Now, if they have to search containers, we'll make sure food's in containers. If they have to track on the floor, we'll make sure the food's on the floor. If they have to air scent, we will make sure the food's up in the air. So the food teaches great patterns. And also while we're doing this, if you learn to watch the dog as they're searching, you can tell the difference between when they're coasting through area, when they're coasting to catch a whiff of something, and the minute they, they, they get a strike. They get a strike on a, a, a source of smell and they want to follow it in. It's when we call they go hot. So you can use it for tracking, for trailing, and for area searching or substance search patterns. You will need to be aware of when you place this food out, how the environment affects air movement because they're working the air to find out where it is. And as it ages, how much further it drags away. If the, if the weather is damp, how much it affects the actual ability of the dog to search. And then again, how obstacles will actually affect air movement. So it's quite a good um, training exercise for people as much as dogs. So open the box. So this is the suggestion. If I am going to an area to train, I will have my treat bags or my, my box of food. And as I open the box, and I'm sure most dogs learn the sound of you opening that box, it's a cue that the training session has begun. Now, the difference between real life and a training session is that in a session, I want 100% a, a of your focus on me, not on walking across the street. So this is my cue that we're going to be in the classroom. The dog will become alert and inquire to me, oh, what are we going to do? So we use it as an open cue for starting the session. And also when I close the pot, it's my end of session cue. The focus is to me as to what information will secure this available food. So then I'm going to give them cues or I might be playing different food games but that presence of that food is a cue. We also teach the dog that just because there's food in the area, I want it to be a cue primarily to focus on me. The only time they focus on the box is under different conditions, not when I'm actually moving around the environment. 
So a training session is a is a focus where this box is open. The two of us are going to be having a very clear, deep conversation. And you have to then be careful that you don't live in a house that's full of these cues. So I want it to be a special, unique situation that this open box of food is going to lure good focus and the food is away when we're not actually wanting you to focus on me. If it's around all the time, it can tend to actually devalue its presence and it stops being a good lure. So, but once this box is open, you should not toddle off and have a conversation with somebody else. You should not be answering the phone unless you close the box. So if I want my dog to focus on me under this lure suggestion conditions, then I should be focusing on the dog. So that's the range that we've had a look at. You can see how at, on the left hand side here, focusing on the nose is very obvious. There's very little else the dog can do. And probably you know, the skeptics of luring on this nose here, the dog is probably not aware of what they're doing. So if we lure the dog to walk round an object with food on the nose, I doubt if they'll notice the object. But that's the point of that particular obvious luring, is to get the dog past something that we don't want them to notice. But once we start to move down this, this, this channel to suggestions, these are just suggestions to help the dog and they're probably taking information from everything else that's happening around them at the same time. So if we get down to a scent invitation and they're used to looking behind the sofa for food, they'll be aware that the sofa is there and they're lured to go behind it. They know exactly what that's about. But the two that get mixed up are this reward station and open the box. So reward stations, very specific, maybe use a unique pot and the dog is either on a grooming table or the pot is on a surface where they know they are going to focus on that whilst I move away. The difference with the open bag or box is I might have that on the side unit, but the dog will actually come with me away from that box. And because they then respond to the cues or the training, I will travel to the box to go and collect food for them. So this is what we call shopping. So now we can start to see with new eyes that luring has a vast range of exquisite teaching and communication to be able to make clear what we want the dogs to actually succeed at. So before you begin, you do need to have a clear understanding of how the behaviour occurs. So don't just say, oh, I'm going to do this, that and the other without actually viewing it before it happens. Have a think about it. So if we're going to teach the dog a movement, in what order does this movement occur and at what speed? So if you're doing something simple like teaching a dog to sit, what happens first? Does their head go up first or do they move their tail? Do the back feet come towards the front feet or the front feet go back towards the back feet? If they go from a sit to a lie down, do they roll onto one hip or do they go down in a straight action? If you want to teach the dog to do a bow, you have to be quite clear the difference between a bow that's like a play bow where the dogs end up resting on their elbows or that stretch that they do when they first wake up where they're not resting on their elbows at all. And if we try and lure the stretch bow, we're probably going to be in trouble unless we want the dog to stretch because it's not the same behaviour as the resting on the elbows. If they're resting on their elbows, they can hold that position for quite a while. And how fast do they do it? What speed does it go at? So if we're doing a continual movement like walk and trot, can you recognise the difference between the two? What does the dog do to change from a walk to a trot? How does it happen? Or are we looking for a limited movement where only a small section of the dog moves? The dog might be standing still whilst they lift a paw. Or they could be lying down while they put both paws over their face. So we want limited movements. We need to know how they're happening. And again, a finite movement, a movement where the dog does a movement and ends in a certain position. What does it actually look like? So this is a tool where you can teach very, very, very good accuracy. And we need to know before we start to use the lure, because the dogs will follow the lure wherever we take them. If we don't know how to accurately describe what they're going to do, we're not going to have an accurate behaviour. And you need to be able to replicate it again and again. So if you get that super sit where the dog's pelvis is engaged, they're sitting upright with a, a good deportment, 
but you don't know how to replicate it, then our practice sessions are going to be a mixture of good sits and sloppy sits and dumpy sits and crooked sits and all the rest of it. The energy and the behaviour. So do they need a certain amount of momentum or balance to be able to be successful in what they're doing? So at the end of the day, your best friend, and we have no excuses for now, is video. You video everything. You video other people's dogs. You video your dogs. And your dogs will have hundreds of movements going on throughout the day, which are probably lured. So they may run to the window and have a look out the window. What lured them to do that? Was it a sound? Was it a scent of something in the kitchen? And when they go to the window, do they stand on their back feet, put their feet on the window sill to have a look out? How does this happen? Yes, what does it look like when it happens? So by getting good video, you train your eye to observe how the behaviour happens and how the lure actually elicits that behaviour. So we certainly do need to be clear of the geometry of how the dogs move. So if we want to move a dog around an object in a circle, you have to be aware that this is what we call a car and a trailer or a car and a caravan. So the front fit and the back fit need to be considered at the same time. If you lure along the path of where the dog's going to go, you will tend to find that they go straight to where the lure is. They'll take a shortcut and just follow that food. So this is not the correct way to lure to go around something. You need to think of how the back end of this caravan is actually going to come round the surface. So that lure hand needs to be accurate. So you can plan where you're actually going to lure. And when we look at it in practice, the path of the lure is outside the path of where the dog's going to walk. So it does take some planning before we can actually use it effectively. Now, the big question everybody tends to, to worry about is how do we get rid of the lure or going off lure? That, you know, when you take your dogs out for a walk every morning, if they once nearly caught a rabbit they will still go back to that same spot. And they go back to that same spot on the memory of having nearly caught the rabbit. And that will last years. So the rabbit's not there. The rabbit's grandchildren are probably not even there anymore, but the dog will still go back to that spot. So don't be too worried that we can't go off lure. It is quite straightforward once you get your heads around it. So observation, analysis, planning, we've done all this stuff, we've watched how the behaviour happens, we've worked out how we're going to actually move our hands, what dynamics we're going to use, what dimension we're going to work in, what speed we're going to lure at, and we've planned how to break the behaviour down into small steps. It still matters with luring that we don't try and ask them to learn too much at one time. So as we're teaching this essential information, we are on full lure. Yes, it's this hot lure that the dog is going, oh, yes, there's the food. I want that food. Show me what I'm going to have to do. And over time, we're going to go off lure. So during this teaching phase, the dog will become alert. If they have experience of being cute, listen, uh, lured, they will start to listen to that lure, listen to the cues that are coming off the lure, how our hands move. At the same time, as they're following this food, they're developing muscle patterns and movements. So they're learning maybe how to sit backwards, but sit up in a way that's a good collected sit, not the sloppy, let's just put my butt on the floor and hope a piece of food will arrive. Or you may be luring them to lie into a nice lion or sphinx down, as opposed to just flop down because you're, you're completely knackered. So the way we use the lure develops very specific muscle patterns and movements. Then as we go on, we're still practicing, we're still giving the dog lots of information, but the lure is becoming less relevant. You can even start to go to the point where you lure it, you tell the dog what they've learnt, you can click if you like, and then fetch another piece of food to feed the dog. So the lure doesn't even become the piece of food they eat, another piece of poo comes out. And that quickly starts to make the way you use your hand become more important than what's in your hand. And whilst the dogs are going through this practice stages, they start to show, I think I've got this, but, but don't go away yet. Just don't go away yet. It's like learning something on a computer where somebody shows you what they're going to do and you go, yes, 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 I understand that. And you sit down and you start it and then you start to lose a bit of confidence. This is the same stage that the dogs are at. They've got an idea 
but they're not confident to show you exactly what they've learned. But then they start to go through this session and they go, oh, did I do that? Don't go away yet. Did I get that right? Yes, you gave me a piece of food. I got that right. Cool. This is good. Now they're starting to go off lure. OK, so now what we, we use is the hand or the cup that held the food. Yes, it just becomes a cue. Yes, and they know this and they're going to ask, will there be food afterwards? So what was critical information just becomes the cue and food will come afterwards because the dogs have told us, hey, no, you don't need to show me anymore. Probably if we actually stop this phase happening. So if every time they think they've got it, we need we go back again. We go backwards to giving them that food right close to their face. We almost suppress the desire to go off lure, that desire to go operant. You know, the, you're, you're learning how to use something on the computer, but just as you start to hesitate, your teacher steps in and shows you how to do it. And you go, oh, OK. So, yes, you're going to hesitate. Now, this is the real art in luring as a teacher. When do you be to be nearby and let them work it through in their own pace? And when do you need to be nearby and actually suggest, if they're going to get completely stuck, how to succeed? That is the art. And only you know your dog. You start to look for the indicators that they just don't need so much of the lure anymore. They just need a suggestion. They're going from all the information you could give them as to what you want to, oh, I've got the idea of this. Is this, is this what you're looking for? And then you use the lure to back up what they're suggesting to do. But there is a stage where I want to stay at developing muscle patterns and movements. And at that point, I'm going to keep the lure capping any progress. So at this point, I might want to practice uh, the action of going from the stand into the lion down and back into the stand. And to develop that um, with superbly fine muscle movement, I'm probably going to lure it three or four hundred times at least and I will lure it in quite a slow fashion because I want the movement to develop power and flexibility it's not a fast jerk action it's a controlled movement down and a controlled movement back up to the stand the same as if I want a dog to walk backwards I like to have the dog moving with a nice flowing even action backwards and that takes a lot of time to develop well, because dogs are going to try and earn that food as quick as possible, they will want to show us what they've learned. And I've had too many dogs just go hit the floor as fast as possible because they can see I'm going to lure them into a down. And that skill of anticipation actually gets them into trouble. It starts them not using their muscles properly. So if, it, if it's, it's critical that you develop a specific muscle pattern, you're going to say to the dog, nope, you're going to stay on this lure for the rest of your life. So if I'm developing a trotting action and I want the dogs to maybe trot in heel work or trot off around objects, my warm up will be on the lure, on the cup. This is what walking is. Get your balance. Relax into the movement. This is what trotting is. Relax. Keep it controlled. OK, now we can go and do the other exercise. So when I have developed these motor skills, these motor patterns, or I have built up all this motor memory and I've got a fit dog, if I need this behavior to have nothing to do with the cup or the hand lure, then I will just shape it from scratch and I start all over again and I attach a new unique cue. But because the dog's already got the physical movement to be able to do it, this will happen in a very, very quick time. Probably five or six suggestions of just some shaping and the dog goes, oh, that move. Yes, I can do that move. No cup, no lure, purely operant. So we just start again and they will get it very, very quickly. So the way the lure is used may be more important than what you actually lure. So using, if you view a lure as a good piece of information and communication, as opposed to baiting the dog into doing something, we start to change the way we use it. We take away that urgency that the dog must do something, have to do this way, got to do that. And it starts to become a very skillful, very professional, elegant way of actually teaching. So this is a lured behavior. 
Being a collie, he tends to like to do it fast because he wants to get it right as quick as possible. And I need him to do it carefully and slowly. So I want him to practice moving his feet in a very specific way in relation to me. And that is the sort of accuracy that can come out of careful luring. So if I look, this is my wall of all the things I've trained through hand lures, mostly cup on a stick, certainly food and place. Yes, this is what we can teach. We can teach all of our freestyle moves. We can teach fitness moves. We can teach the dog to work at a distance. We can teach the dog how to use fine movements of their bodies. We can certainly use it for rehabilitation training. We can certainly use it for building up different patterns of learning. So for anybody to say that luring is for wimps or luring is only for beginners, I think not. I think we need a completely new view of this. So go luring. There's nothing wrong with luring. Generally, it's for nose first behaviours, but I've taught backing with luring, no trouble at all. But if you use it skillfully and with thoughtful application, you can end up with exquisitely accurate, consistent behaviours. And you make the learning process for your dogs much easier. I can't think of any better reason than just making it easier for your dogs to learn. Use a lure. Hopefully we'll see you either on the luring workshops or on the luring online courses. But don't doubt it. Go away, try it out, become luring skilled. <laughs>